Uh, good evening, legacy okay. viewers. Uh, my interview tonight is, uh, I think, the third interview with um, Andre Udendahl. He has told us of his time at the medics, his time at 3-1. In between, he did the infantry officers course. And then last time out, he told us about the selection process for Five Recce. Um, tonight, he's going to tell us about his time at Five Recce. Uh, welcome, Andre. Welcome back. Thanks. Hey, Andrew. Yeah, if you can give us a bit of uh, insight into your your time after the selection process and all the, the training, etc., at Five Recce. Yeah. So, um, as as uh, as the training cycle was finishing up, we we were kind of being interviewed into which units we we wanted to go. So we had the options of one recce, which is done in Durban, which is you know urban and more urban warfare and we had four recce in um langaban which is a uh, seaborne you know like kind of seals uh, seals training and then five recce which was uh, uh more counter insurgency and offensive teams you know basically doing uh, raids and that kind of stuff so uh, and then and then we had the another option of the small teams uh the recce small teams was also recruiting they wanted to boost their their teams so um we actually had the option option of that so a bunch of us actually applied for the small teams uh recce small teams which are also based at five recce um so i i applied for that and uh and got into that into that group uh so we moved up to palabora uh five of us i think moved up to palabora and went to small teams uh, small teams was established way back with uh, chris schulenberg in rhodesia he started this concept of infiltrating with one partner you know, working in real small teams, you know, two, two men, two men uh, reconnaissance teams. And it's something not done anywhere. I don't think even today, you know, when later on I connected with some SAS people and I've spoken to US Special Forces folks and nobody operates in teams smaller than four or five. So, you know, the, the, the two man concept is really, really unique and uh, unique to South Africa. So, um, and then it was, um, Picked up by Jack Kreef and 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 the famous Diddies as well, who you know really built up the unit in in Five Rec. Um, and by the time I came up there, it was uh, Chris Studler was 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 running it. So we, we went up, and then we had to do another training course to specialize in uh, in small teams because uh, the the mindset is very different from your standard offensive teams. You know, offensive teams, you always in the back of your mind think you're going to fight your way out of something. And with small teams, it's the opposite. So you you don't want to be, you don't want to be, you know, uh, actually in combat or in contact. So you're doing evasion all the time, and you you're not training for for uh, for for combat. You you're just trying to evade the whole time. And later later on, I'll tell a story of like where I actually had to do escape and evasion, and and the mindset was just different. So, um, but yeah. So anyhow, we uh we started doing training uh really specializing in uh in small team infiltrations um you know getting our kit everything was more specialized you, basically the the options with small teams operations is that you want to avoid any local populations or any local resources so you carry as much as you can uh you don't want to go to local water holes you don't want to go anywhere where you know the where you're going to be compromised or picked up so we started practicing carrying very heavy kit I mean, a small team infiltration, typically you start off with your kids weighing about 100 kilograms of that. Half of that is water that you're carrying. Um, very little, you know, in the form of offensive equipment. The the doctrine at that time was nothing. No, you know, just basically one or two magazines and an, and, and an AK and, and that is it. You know, so um, the rest was just food and water that you carried. And then your, you know, whatever specialist equipment you were carrying, you know, like night side, night side equipment or... If you're doing some kind of like demolitions, or whatever, obviously be carrying whatever that is. But I started practicing all the techniques of, you know, walking at night. How do you walk? How do you, um, you know, it's just anti-tracking. Like, you know, you cannot leave any any trace because you typically are infiltrating through uh, areas that could be, you know, thick with local population. Those folks are always really aware of what's going on, you know, around them, looking at the tracks in the morning they'd see something weird and they'd report it to to the enemy so anti-tracking skills was was huge so we did 
a lot of anti-tracking. What we actually had as a technique, we had these big shoe covers, like big shoe covers that we put over our boots as well. So kind of created a, a stranger track, maybe looked a bit like an elephant track, but also it didn't leave much track. And then, you know, just the, the drills of like, how fast do you walk? Um, when you stop to rest, hey, get up, make sure you don't, you know, leave indentations of your pack in the ground, you know, everything very, very disciplined. So we, we practiced all those techniques. And then the final exercise was a reconnaissance of the radar station at Marib's Corp in the Eastern Transvaal. So we had to infiltrate and then do a complete reconnaissance of the of the uh, radar station, which was heavily guarded at the time. Um, and some of the things we also learned, as I recall now, uh, our technology was pretty advanced. So we we carried um, what we called uh, data entry terminals. Terminals. It is a, a a device like a little computer. And uh, we're talking about 1987, right? So computing was just coming in. It wasn't a mainstream thing, but we already had these data entry terminals where you you type in you type in your situation. Limit limited memory, of course. So you type in your situation. Um, and and then uh, you transmit that back to base at every scheduled because the the theory is that you know you keep on updating information all the time. Whereas when we came in, the um, the initial instinct was you know you go you do your you do your recce, you find your information, you come back and you give it to everybody. But that's kind of too late. So what you have to be doing is giving information real time. So you know every every two or three hours we'd be doing a a a, a scheduled connect with uh, with base and then send send the latest information we had and we do that at the data entry terminal and we had um, uh, frequency hopping uh, radios and uh, the the communications was a huge part as well because uh, the enemy is always looking for radio signals and they can you know they can find out where you are so you know just by triangulating off your signals so we were really advanced in in evading that and in fact it was um, uh, Dave Scales was uh, Chris Schulenberg's radio operator in Rhodesia. He he actually was running the communications for us, and we did intensive you know, radio communication uh, training as well. So literally, you'd be online for one or two seconds, uh, have have a have a scheduled scheduled time to connect with the HQ, um, have all your um, your your message uh, encrypted in a in a data entry terminal, come up. Um, Get on the frequency hopping frequency, send your your transmission, and then shut it down. So it'll be one or two seconds, literally, to 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 communicate and then move on, and then maybe get a you know a a message back, which was in the same in the same manner. It'll come back on the frequency hopping, come into a data entry terminal, and we'd unscramble it and be able to see if there's any any change in uh, uh, the mission or or any any updates for us. So that's that's how we we operated. So we'd have these uh, regular schedule times. And then also we learned, you know, we obviously practiced a lot of escape and evasion. Um, once you plan your infiltration, because a small team's inf infiltration is obviously you've got some mission where you want to go and find out, target an enemy, uh, find out the enemy, and you obviously infiltrating behind enemy, enemy lines. And then you plan your infiltration. And then also you plan if you're compromised anywhere along the line, how you're going to come out. And you have, you know, um, grid references planned that you going to meet up at certain certain times according to where you are and, and that's where you can get picked up or you, you know or if you if you split up from your partner you meet up at that specific grid reference so we practice all this planning as well um so each each operation was like you know pretty detailed in in how we would operate and what we would do and uh our personal drills were very um uh well well kind of practiced and all our equipment of course was completely pseudo so we we had no no link to any western uh equipment at all so nothing linked to south africa uh you know we wore we wore uh, enemy uh, equipment we wore fapla fapla uniforms all our food and everything was kind of neutralized and put in uh plastic bags you know so no no labels at all um and then of course the planning of the you know the food you have little bags and you you know exactly what you can eat when and uh, even things like, you know, your sort of um, evolutions, you know, like like you can't leave anything behind. So you'd either be, you know, pooping into a hole, putting it in a bag and carrying that, or if it is pretty safe, you just make sure you cover everything up. So we, you know, there was there was no trace or any chance of dogs or anything finding where, where you'd been. So it was pretty pretty detailed, and you 
got to realize if you on your own two man in the in in enemy territory you're not walking in the day you know so you're walking at night and then you're finding some place to hide up in the day and you're just keeping dead still so you know everything is camouflage there's camouflage netting if we carried and you know covered ourselves with camouflage and you're kind of just dozing in the day uh keeping in one ear open so we practiced all that did the um did the practice Ricky on Marip's Corp, um, and that was successful. One of our members, um, Sean Ward, I'm going to mention his name, uh, he actually walked around the whole mountain, which is extremely dangerous. I don't know how he did it because there's some really steep cliffs, but he went the extra mile, went around the whole thing, and then all the time we had to draw pictures and send information, so we, we scoped out the whole, the whole radar station, um, and they weren't alert because they knew we were there and, and and they didn't find us. So, you know, the whole thing was successful. Um, so then we fought past as the, the um, small team operators. And that was, I think it was about five week, five week course. Pre pretty intense, very physical as well, because we were still almost a little bit of a selection um, mentality. So we had some kind of like um, ultra endurance events, like things called the Iron Recce, where we'd have to, you know, do runs and carry, um, uh, heavy heavy poles and you know just just these like mini mini um ultra marathon things that we had to do from time to time during that training um and then towards the end we uh we did a um we did a long run and, and climbed up the um the mountains in um in the Palaboria and there's like one it's called a gormo I don't know if people remember like it's like these mountains in um in Palabora and people kind of know them if they if they know those like uh, granite granite like outcrops Climbed up to the top of one, and uh, um, Chris Dudler was standing, pointing out to to Palabora and the base and everything, and he lost his footing, and he went over the edge and grabbed uh, one of the other um, students, and both of them fell down a cliff about twenty meters, um, and uh, it sounded like watermelons hitting. You know, you could literally hear them hitting the rock. So we had to get down. And eva evacuate them. They were still okay, alive. Um, I think Chris had broken his back, and um, Simon had fractured. Or one of the the other student had fractured his um, his back and and skull, and we had to evacuate them to the base or to a point where one of us ran back to get support. So that kind of turned into a, a real life uh, evacuation situation. So we got them down the mountain. Uh, two 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 of two guys ran back, uh, got the medics, and we. Um, got them Kazavak, so they they were out um and, and that that came to the end of our training we uh we were we were then finished um uh at that time some of us were quite anti-establishment we were kind of um you know uh, anti-authoritarian and rubbing up against the the uh the, the leadership of, of of small teams at the time they were very conservative very rigid very well drilled and we were kind of um uh into you know when we had time to go we would go party and we we kind of liberal in 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 uh, in arguing with things so so there was a little bit of friction and and i didn't do very well on the uh, on the uh, on the actual course and i was like rated as you know that they, they would they will try they'll try me as a small team small team operator but i don't think they were really impressed with my attitude at the time but anyway i was in so then um <clears throat> a couple of weeks i think a couple of weeks after uh when when Chris and the guys came back from the hospital. Um, we get, were getting ready for our first um, first operational deployment, and this was in around February '87. Uh, uh, so we were getting ready to go and start practicing our techniques. Uh, they called it trigger time at the time. There was no real operations going on then at the time, so we were going to go up to Angola and just do some 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 missions specifically just to get our our skills, our skills up, and then just get get experience. So, um, we flew up to Andangwa and uh, and went to the five one, stayed in the five one recce base, um, uh, and got, kind of got ourselves settled down and and started preparing for 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 operations. At that time, um, uh, it was the Cubans were getting pretty pretty aggressive. And uh, we're starting to build up forces to move right down to the border. And this is kind of like the last, the last um, uh, big big pushes in, in those areas. This is like um, eighty eight, uh, early eighty eight. Um, 
n nobody knew, but they were busy building up and wanting to push down to the uh, to the um, southwest Africa border. So we came up at that time. Um, we met with the uh, the head of the sector at the time. It was uh, Colonel Serfontaine. He was uh, ex infantry school colonel. That he was. He met up with us and he just said, "I don't want any newbie wreckies in here. You know, putting exposing themselves, getting themselves into danger. So you guys just." You know, just he, he wasn't really really happy with with us with us being there and wasn't that supportive of us doing you know just some arbitrary operations. But then very quickly, um, the the Cuban the Cuban build up started and they become aware of what is going on and suddenly they actually needed us to to get involved in uh, trying to analyze the um, the situation. It was pretty pretty chaotic and um, if anybody remembers Angola at that time, the airspace was completely locked down, so it was very hard for us to. Get into Angolan airspace and uh, do even air recies because um, because of the the MIGs and the and the missile uh, the missile presence. So it was very tough for our air force to get into into Angolan airspace. So having eyes on the ground was was pretty critical. So suddenly we were not in practice mode anymore. Things things were things were starting to happen. So um, uh, I started planning for my first operation. The first operation was at, this is. Um, Going to be east of Zongongu. They wanted us to go so east of the, oh, sorry, west of the uh, Kuneni River. It was uh, yeah. where a lot of buildup was happening around the Tchipa area, west of the Kuneni, and they wanted us to go in just to, just to see what was going on. So just to do a infiltration, see if we could find tracks, see if we could um, just see any enemy movement. So we were planning for that initial uh, infiltration. Uh, myself and uh, the I, I worked with two operators. Uh, Joseph uh, Joseph was um, was one, and um, and Mike Mashaya was was the other. Uh, Joseph was a Mozambican, and Mike Mike Mashaya was an ex Salu scout. So they were my partners. Uh, but I'd be only working with one of them in 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 both situations. This op, my first operation, I was going to go in with Joseph. Um, he's a Portuguese speaker, so he could pass as a um, as an enemy, uh, you know, if it came to, he could speak Portuguese and wearing the uniforms. If anything happened, he could kind of like uh, try to get us out by by passing passing as a as an enemy. So that's kind of the the, the approach we took. So um, we were tasked to uh, recce up to east of Zongongu and just 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 recce and see if we could find any signs of uh, of enemy activity, um, and. We infiltrated with uh, three two battalion. Three two was um, a company. Of three two was moving up towards the Tajipa area, so we infiltrated with them. And um, I think on the second day, we realized uh, this is actually the area that I operated with when I was in um, uh, with the Bushmen. So I knew the actually knew the area quite well. I actually knew it, like you know, kind of I was really familiar. I knew where I was a lot of the time, which is strange, but. Uh, um, moving up with three two, is, and it was a pretty quiet area at that time. It was mainly swap over infiltra infiltrations. There was no there was no mechanized enemy presence at all. And uh, moving into three two, we suddenly realized things were very different all of a sudden because we heard um, uh, um, mechanized um, equipment moving our way, probably BRDMs, and uh, and we realized that there was some. Heavy, heavy enemy presence, and they were they were coming our way, looking for obviously patrolling, and looking for us. So that's again where I saw how how professional three two battalion was as a unit. I mean, we had these um, must have been two or three enemy BRDMs coming our way, um, and like no panic, three two just unpacked, put their machine list, their kit down in place, deployed, started getting ready for for con uh, for contact. Uh, RPG gunners went off to the flanks. Everything just unpacked without any orders. It was like really professional watching watching how they how they operated, just getting ready for for what is was what is to come. Um fortunately the uh, the enemy didn't find us and they and they kind of went went past. But uh but it just showed that uh the game was different from previously when I was uh in, in three one or two oh one and just doing anti insurgency operations. Now there was actually, you know, serious uh, armored armored enemy. In the area, so we split off from uh, three two, and we carried on with our mission up um, east of Zong, uh, west of Zongongu, uh, just just patrolling, listening at night, and suddenly we started hearing, um, we heard mechanized equipment, so we could hear that uh, that there were like heavy heavy vehicles riding around, and then we started coming across ta tank tank spurs, and we we re we reported back that we were finding 
tank spurs and we heard movement at night uh, a lot of movement at night and that was um i think that was fourth of may and then we suddenly when we were making uh, um, communications we got notification that um that uh, uh there'd been a contact and a uh, south african troop had been captured um uh, so it was um uh, Poppenfuss, I think, was his name. He was um, he was captured. I think he was the medic for 101 Battalion. They were involved in the contact with the Cubans, and he was actually captured. So we were tasked to move up uh, to a little uh, a little town northeast of uh, Zongongu to see if he'd maybe been taken into um, into a. There was a, quite a big um, uh, hospital there, and to see if, if he'd been taken into the hospitals. So uh, suddenly, it was like kind of. Um, interesting situation so myself and joseph um moved up and then we got close to the town and this is like all within a day got close to the town uh and then prepared ourselves for the recce for that night to go into the town and see if we could see anything um i remember we we stashed our kit uh, because we were going to do a, a fast recce typically when you infiltrating you carrying this heavy kit you're only doing like 10 kilometers a night because you have to walk so slowly and you know you have to be really cautious and you've got this heavy kit so, but we we dumped our kit for for fast trek. So we're just carrying our, our webbing and, and rifles, and uh, so we cashed our kit, and then walked in towards the town uh, to try and see if we could see if there's any activity. I mean, was, thinking back now, it was a complete waste of time because clearly, you know, there's no ways that the enemy would have stopped so closely if they had captured anybody. They would have taken them out as fast as possible. But anyhow, everybody was trying. I think Mano Ace, uh, another small team operator, he was deployed as well to try and find. Pop and Fuss. Then yeah, we went. Um, we started infiltrating and we started going through enemy positions, and it was quite, quite interesting because these guys had no no discipline and they would be sitting. You know, they had like anti aircraft, um, 14, 14.5 anti aircraft gun emplacements all around. And these guys would be drinking and then just firing off, firing off uh, at night, like randomly. And uh, as we were coming towards the town, one gun emplacement just started firing. And it was like two or three hundred meters away from where we were so we got quite a fright because we thought that they'd seen us but they hadn't they were just drunk and messing around you know, like 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 soldiers do so we uh we got into the town or could hear the like the bell ringing of the church but the town was like nothing going on just ghost town there was nothing at all so we kind of looked around and saw that there was nothing no equipment no you know the the locals in in angola at night just shut down and nothing going on. there was nothing going on so we came back to our kit and it was actually amazing because we cashed our kit you know, under some bushes in the middle of the night, went up to the recce, and then came back and we came straight back to our kit. It was, it was remarkable how good our, our navigation was. And everybody knowing what Angola is like, it's flat as a pancake. There's no there's no features. So, you know, all our navigation was all, um, you know, just counting counting um, counting steps or just time uh, time and uh, you know, you, you know for a certain time how fast you walk, time and 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 um, and compass bearing. So you kind of always compass bearing how long you walked and just keep on tracking that. It was just instinctive. By then, we 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 just practiced that all the time, so we kind of knew where we were. But it was remarkable that we came straight back to our kit, and uh, uh, we made comms, and then uh, uh, we were told to 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 exfiltrate and and get back to get back to base. Um, so we started exfiltration. This was like um, about 80 kilometers away from the border that we that we were at. So we had a, like a 80 kilometer exfiltration, and we were told to get get out as fast as possible. We were supposed to move down to meet up a unit of three to battalion at the border at one of the um, at one of the um, um, what are those um, um, like every ten kilometers, they had a uh, they had like a, a mile post. I can't remember what they what they called. Anyhow, so we're supposed to meet up three two at one of at one of the uh, at one of the mile posts on the uh, on the on the border. Um, so we started exfiltrating, and uh, we decided to just push through. So we walked through the night, and then we were going to push through through the day, which we wouldn't normally do. But we were exfiltrating, so um, we carried on walking through the day, uh, just going as fast as we could. And um, we got compromised. We came we came close to um, uh, a really big like uh, um, uh, settlement it's in the um, Donguena area. I remember 
and the locals saw us. I was, of course, you know, black face, black is beautiful, walking Joseph. So they saw us from far. Uh, and I kind of went back into the bushes and just walked over and speaking Portuguese to the to the locals and everything, but they were suspicious and we saw a couple of running off and they and they obviously running close running off to the the, the local enemy unit that was there. And we kind of thought we were in pretty big trouble. So we then started moving really fast and indeed they got hold of the military the local military unit, but all they did was start throwing kind of mortars mortars around. So they're just chucking mortars randomly. So they weren't actually chasing us. But then we were going really fast, and um, I remember coming, just walking down uh, at speed, and coming up was this, you know, we, we all remember in a land, you know, the, the typical woman walking with, you know, calabash on her head with water and uh, barefoot along the path, and I just remember seeing this woman, and we stopped and we asked her, trying to ask her because we were running out of water by now, ask, trying to ask her, you know, like where was water, and she, she was indicating, yeah, there's water, water close, water close. But um, in November, and water close was walking is like still maybe an hour's walk away. So we eventually got water, uh, topped up water, and then and then got down to the got down to the uh, border and at the at the mile post we were at, uh, and then we tried to make connection with three two and the three two unit was the other mile post which is um, uh, ten miles uh, ten kilometers uh, west of us. So we were kind of stuck. We couldn't go into Southwest Africa because we were in you know enemy uniform. Uh, the area was hot, so we had, uh, you know, Kufut and three, uh, 101 Battalion were patrolling that area heavily looking for insurgents, so they might have picked us up as insurgents, so we didn't want to go into into Southeast Africa, so we, fortunately, uh, a helicopter pick, pickup was organized for us, so a helicopter from Ruokana came out, uh, Alouette, and they picked us up and uh, flew us back into Ruokana and uh, and dropped us off there, uh, so that, that was the end of the mission, so we debriefed and and uh and uh so that that is that is my first uh my first uh small team operation so no real contact but actually contact because you know getting the feeling of going into into enemy area behind you know walking past guards and uh getting into into that environment was uh was pretty unusual uh, i do remember also um the one night one day while we were waiting up uh you know because you'd lie up in the day um uh and then walk it only do your walking or moving at night except as i said when you're exfiltrating um lying in one of the local uh herd boys was herding you know herding cows and was coming into our area and uh we were lying under some bushes and i remember this kid just getting closer and closer and it just you know it was so surreal with how how scared you start feeling you, know, you just don't want to be compromised and it's just so scared that he's going to see you um and uh, and he didn't actually see us. I remember lying there under a bush, and actually a little flock of birds came and landed in the bush that I was lying at, and we were lying so still that they didn't know we were there. So I was lying in the bush, and these like birds were just like sitting right right there by us. And this kid was messing around for a couple of hours until he moved on, and we just still as anything, and then he moved on. But that's that's kind of testament to how how stealthy we were in operating and moving and, you know, not leaving any tracks and how camouflaged we were, you know, so it's kind of testament for, for our training. The kid didn't pick us up at all or see us. So, but, you know, it's super nerve wracking. It's like playing hide and go seek for real, even though this kid's not going to do anything to you. You just don't want to get caught. It's that natural, natural feeling. Um, there was a kind of interesting movie that came out uh, with American Special Forces called Lone Survivor, which, Kind of tells their small teams operations and how they they dealt with uh, with those situations. It was very very different um, from from how we were trained. But uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it, it is it was pretty easy. But I, but I loved it. It was um, it is it is it is really exciting and pretty much what I wanted to do. I mean, going around sneaking around and you know it is it is very exciting. And uh, and so that I was I was kind of hooked. I was really I really I really enjoyed I really enjoyed this this uh, kind of operation. So that is that is the end of my first op. So, and then tell me, Andre, just so quickly, how many small teams would have been around at the same time? I mean, you obviously one team, but would there been just yeah. one or two yeah. teams? Yeah, there were. You've had... Yeah, there, there were there were three or four teams uh, being deployed at that time, all, all with senior operators and with us juniors being trained. So yeah, that's that's uh, that's what was happening at that time. I think there were three three teams that were being four no four. There were four teams being deployed, all with uh, a senior. A senior black operator, you know, because that gives you the pseudo, the pseudo uh, option with with us uh, more junior white operators. Um, 
you know being being trained and being being coached by them okay so that is the end of the first stop and then um because of the uh the incursion they they were trying to it came up that there was a massive logistics base um uh, in an area called Donguena, which is not which is which is let me just look at the map I have here, which is um way up um way up past um past Kasinga, you know, kind of up there's a main highway that goes all the way to to um uh to Namib. Uh, there's a main that's like main road so there's a, a big a big uh, logistics base that they suspected was up up there which they wanted to find out about and i think they, they wanted to attack that but they they couldn't get accurate satellite imagery so they wanted to send a team in and heaven knows why but they decided to send me in to do that recce with with joseph the guy the the operator that i did recce with and and mike mashai so we were going to do infiltrate so we had to plan the infiltration but we we're going to infiltrate and then and then um, uh, Joseph was going to stay behind as a kind of comms liaison, and, and then Mike and I would go forward to to try and find this um, this logistics base. So uh, it's quite impressive because we went to uh, headquarters at Rakona, and um, the the chief of intelligence at the time they had all the information they had, and then they had like, computers with printers, like a whole new thing, and they actually printed out the the map of the area. Uh, you know, with where they thought the the base was, it was very interesting, and uh, and we got satellite imagery. It was actually then we started seeing that we were, you know, working pretty closely with America still, because this is like satellite satellite imagery. It's obviously got from the CIA um, of the area, and you could see there was there was something going on there, but they wanted us to go into detail and, and find out find out exactly what there was and where, and um, and. Obviously, you know, get get some uh, grid references markers in place so that if they wanted to come into the air force and bomb, they they would bomb accurate, accurately. So, this big operation for you know, this is you're talking about you know, 400 kilometers behind enemy lines. Um, uh, so we started planning for this. Um, uh, at that time, Chris Schulenberg, the the legendary Sulu scout, uh, was assigned. He was with us. He was actually working for South African military at that time, and he. He came and, and and helped us plan that, which is amazing. Um, so he he helped us with all the planning, and I started I started getting to know him personally. Um, uh, an amazing guy. I mean, really the opposite of the mentality that we had. He is really relaxed, innovative, you know, very different way, different thinker. You know, so uh, he started helping us plan the operation. You know, there's a number of op op options we could have had. We could have flown in and free fall in. We could have gone in by submarine, but that was too far to come across. Uh, it was decided we were going to infiltrate with UNITA up to a point because a lot of the area was kind of half half uh, enemy, half occupied by UNITA. So we were going to go up um, uh, west of Kasinga, essentially going all the way up. And then we were going to drop off. And then the two of us would do the, the detailed recce and then come back and um, reconnect with UNITA and, and exfiltrate with UNITA. So there's a lot of planning that we had to do. So uh, Chris Schulenberg was there. He actually had his own personal computer, so he was helping type up all the planning uh, on on his computer. And uh, obviously, he's so experienced. I mean, he, anybody knowing anything about him, you know, just read about the Salute Scouts and the and the work he did. He was yeah, an amazing operator. Um, so he was helping with the planning, and and I got to know him and how he worked and operated. And uh, he actually. Um, told me about how, how he would work, which is a little bit different from what we were being trained because we were like trained not to carry, we didn't carry claymore mines or any any offensive um, equipment with us at all. So if we got compromised while we were hiding up, it was basically bombshell and run away. No, no, you know, as I said, no contact at all. But I, I kind of didn't feel comfortable about this because, you know, just from my days at 201, if you, if you, if you're tracking, if you're tracking the enemy, the thing that's going to slow you down is when they put up booby traps, you know. So, so I thought, um, you know, I, I thought I'm, I'm going to do something. So I actually was messing around and, and starting to practice, and I got hold of some um, tripwire mechanisms, and uh, and I was, I was just setting. So I actually created my own. I created like this tripwire mechanism, and I soldered some some nails into the mechanism so you could just push it into a, into a tree quickly. Uh, 
took some in, uh, M26 hand grenades and Cortex and uh, detonators, and I kind of rigged up a a, a booby trap. So essentially, you would have tripwire with a detonator, uh, uh, like two meters of Cortex. Cortex is this high explosive um, uh, kind of it's like a it's like a cord. Um, it's like like a rope, and then and then flip you know flip it over and, and put it into a M26 grenade. So take the grenade throwing mechanism out, but the cortex would essentially become the detonator. So what you would do is set up a tripwire, have the cortex ringing around, and then the hand grenade would be behind whoever tripped off the uh, the tripwire. So the hand grenade would go off behind and you know, slow them down. So I was practicing this and I got it set up and I actually practiced with Mike and how, how we would do it. And it was so fortuitous that I did this. It basically saved our lives in this, in this operation. So uh Christella and the powers that be were not really impressed with this and we are having discussions about how it wasn't part of our, our ethos you know it was my decision so so i got this all set up and i was i was on me and but it's all motivated by chris's experience because he would you know he would set up uh, claymore mines around him just just in case so so we um we did the planning uh i remember meeting with some very senior uh we had to coordinate with the air force and this is where like you know being being in you know, special forces and small teams was amazing because of the planning you had to do you had to obviously then go and coordinate with all the units um including the air force because they would be involved in any hot extractions and we actually met with the legendary john church at the time and he was not impressed with where we were going and he was saying like i don't want to come and pick you up um and fly out there to pick you up and there was a whole discussion, but anyhow, so that was the plan. Uh, we had we had everything set up, so we coordinated the air force, and obviously then the liaison with UNITA, who um, uh, had to be done through the chief of staff intelligence. So all that had to be done. So we planned out the whole operation. In the back of my mind, I was not feeling comfortable about this whole thing. I just thought this is, you know, there's a lot of people knowing that we're there. You know, there's going to be a white operator. So so far up in in Angola, it's just this didn't feel good for me. But anyway, I was young and junior, and I wasn't going to argue with anything, so I was excited. So um, the operation was approved. It's called Operation Garfield, actually. So the operation was approved, and uh, and we kicked off. And um, uh, the first um, first uh, kind of leg was flying out uh, by Dakota at night to uh, to uh, a base called a uh, Unita base called Ionde. So flew out to Dakota, flying, you know, treetop level in the middle of the night, um, and landed at Yonde, and it was like, you know, one of these situations where they they put big um, forty-four gallon drums with fires in, and that's how they marked the the landing strip. So we landed in a like dirt landing strip. Um, we got off the deck, turned around, and beetled out, and they put all the fi- shut all the fires down immediately. So then we spent the first night at this Unita base. And then, uh, then got picked up by Chief of Staff Intelligence um, Unit to infiltrate further west uh, by vehicle. Uh, so the next day was riding the vehicle with um, uh, intelligence uh, forces with also a, um, a company of um, Parabat um, campers, actually. That's quite interesting because I bumped into one of those campers uh, a year later when I was driving. I picked him up. He was, he was hitchhiking. In, in uniform and I picked him up. He was coming back from his other camp and he remembered me from the operation. He's like, oh, you, you survived. And it was kind of fortuitous that I actually met, met him. But anyhow, so we uh, we infiltrated, uh, we went across west uh, with the chief of staff intelligence on, on Caspers and then got dropped off at a, at a, at a kind of um, peripheral or like a unita base, which is kind of getting close to the edge of their area of operation. Um, and we got dropped off there and we were assigned a group of 30, 30 UNITA, but you could just see the the levels of equipment from Yonde going out to where we got dropped off was, you know, they were getting more and more ragtag as we got there. And the, the group that we met up with was just, you know, like hardly had, um, you know, proper equipment. You know, they like no standard uniforms. So they pretty much looked like insurgents themselves. Um, so, so we got dropped off with them to, to start our infiltration, so we were going to go uh, move over west a bit and then head straight up um, um, to to Donguena to the um, to the um, the logistics base that we were supposed to find. Um, my feeling with Unita at the time was, uh, you know, I kind of thought that they 
they would know the bush and know how to operate and uh and so i kind of adapted to their to their techniques and strategies um but you know you have the assumption that people know what they're doing uh and they know what's going on but it's not always not always the case so there's naivety from my side uh, but anyhow so we started we started infiltrating with them so it was a big group we walked maybe you know 30 40 kilometers every day start really early in the morning like 4 a.m in the morning walk uh, rest up in the day walk in the afternoon and then rest up at night so that became the routine for a couple of days uh you know starting the, starting the infiltration um and uh i was carrying um boxes of cigarettes and i was like giving the their platoon commander like every now and then i'd give him a pack of pack of cigarettes and so then he started getting the days i didn't give him cigarettes he came over and said like have i done something wrong and i thought oh, what do you mean so i was like oh, i didn't get my cigarettes today so then i realized it became a in his mind as a routine and that was his you know that is his payment so like every day i was giving him a pack of cigarettes and uh so you need to the, the, the platoon that we were walking with they were carrying our kit and one of them was carrying my backpack it was like you know not advanced equipment like you have today the uh the backpack had a had a aluminium frame and he was carrying it carrying it on, on his head and he snapped the frame so i had to um i had to fix the frame uh uh kind of annoyed me but anyhow i had to fix the frame um which is okay um and uh then we came to our first we were getting more into enemy you know it was contested area so we um we crossed the, the main kasinga the north south kasinga road at night and then i started realizing these guys are not their, ta their tactical skills are not that good because as we got close to the road you know instead of the way we would do things we'd stop you know wait and then send a scout and you know we'd tactically cross the road <laughs> all you need to do is the, as a group of 30 they just came in a big clump and walk across the road in a big clump because they were super nervous and then and then we carried on walking and then i thought this is this is not linear so it was fine but then we rested up the day and that day we started hearing shots so the the um the enemy obviously picked up our tracks crossing the road so they were aware that we were there so that has already should have been a big warning sign for me that we were <clears throat> we were going to be compromised but connecting with the unitas they said it was all fine this always happens so i was like okay um and we carried on so um so we had been it had the enemy was aware of our presence and they knew a group was coming in so and i can only assume then that amongst unita there were they were probably spies and they'd really informed um, uh, the Cubans and FAPLA that there were uh, South African special forces in the area. So th things were like starting to warm up already. So um, we uh, we carried on. Uh, we started moving up north and we got, um, we already passed, passed Kasinga. Um, uh, we were kind of getting up north and then we got came up to old Unita base and uh, there was a about a company company strength you need to in the base and uh um we got to the base and uh for the first time we thought we'll just uh you never unpack your kit but first time i thought we'll just do admin and unpack our kit and just check everything was okay and and just dry things out and whatever and as as we'd unpacked packed our kit um we 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 were suddenly involved in the con contact so the enemy had come up and they made contact with um with the guards down by the river uh, so suddenly the bullets were flying around and, and um, you need to manage to repel them. Um, uh, but it must have just been a, a patrol that was, that was that was kind of looking for us. So we packed up all our stuff um, and uh, one of the Unitas had been shot uh, in the hand. So he came over and I, I patched him up, you know, because I had the medic training. So I patched him up. It wasn't too bad. Um, and it's kind of, you, then you start realizing how hard it is for these guys. They had no big hospitals or anything nearby, no Kazavax or anything. So, you know, he got shot through the hands, so patched him up. Um, and then uh, they wanted us to meet one of their high-ranking UNITA officers, wanted to come and connect with us. So we waited for him and he came over, walked over from one of the main bases and we sat down and and he was very interested in looking at our equipment. And again, I, in hindsight, realized that, you know, we were being totally compromised, you know, so they were looking at our equipment and, you know, they were interested in the, these big anti-tracking boots we were wearing and everything. And, um, and uh, so, you know, I was kind of trusting and I thought, you know, these guys are on our side and, uh, and um, just dealt with the guy, you know, as, as, you know, just spoke through, spoke about the mission, which I probably shouldn't have. 
Uh, but he knew about it already. He knew that we were whatever uh, infiltrating. But you know, so he came with these maps and was telling us where to go and whatever. So it was like he left, and then we um we started the exfiltration. We started moving up north. I think um I remember still clearly it was like the second the second day from then. Um, it was a beautiful day, and um, uh, one of the Unitas uh, boots boots had completely stripped off, and I had. I carried, we always carried like stuff for repairing our kit and I had this um, shoe patch glue and I glued his boot for him and um, and it stuck together and he was like so happy walking around, his boot was fixed and I was fixing my kit as well because my webbing was coming apart so I was actually stitching up my kit, fixing my kit and we heard an aeroplane, we heard this plane like flying and like looked up and saw a, um, a um, Soviet um, passenger plane above us but banking you know it had like it was white it's like a red stripe but it was you know it was a it was a civilian plane but it was banking over us and just doing a bank and i was like this is really suspicious but uh you know and we radioed and 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 uh and communicated in this but didn't get any feedback at all and um uh it was at, you know, at midday and then a couple hours later i was just finishing um fixing my kit so I actually had because we'd you know be in this kind of circular defense you need to be around us and we'd be in the middle you know just a standard circular defense so um I I was with my pack Joseph was you know about 30 meters behind me and Mike was about 30 meters um like west of me and I was just I had my webbing and I'd, I'd been stitching up my webbing I had my webbing on uh luckily and uh and I looked up and I just saw the perimeter defense guys just disappearing. They were just like just just running, just going. So and I just you just know this is not right. And I looked up and there was a skirmish line of, of far play in front of us. They must have been about uh twenty meters away from me. But I could they were just coming through the bush. I could just see them and they and they saw me and they started firing. They opened fire. So like suddenly we're in con con um in contact. And the unitas had just run without without any warning shots at all. So we'd been compromised, obviously, and we were in hot uh, combat. So these guys opened fire at me, and it was just dust around me. I don't know how I didn't get hit. It was, it was, I just don't know. So I, uh, I didn't even fire a shot. I just, you know, this is from training. I just turned around, grabbed my backpack, all hundred kilograms of it, and and Joseph was there. And Joseph left his backpack and he grabbed his escape and evasion bag. He was the radio operator, so he had. He had a small uh, go bag with the you know with a, with a radio in it. He grabbed that, and we just started gapping like already away from the contact, so the contact was coming on at us. So we were trying to go off at an angle. Um, and so him and I connected, and Mike Mike went the other way. And uh, so I was running with this hundred kilogram backpack for maybe fifty meters, and uh, literally it was leaves falling on my head. And I'm not exaggerating; leaves falling on my head. They were firing mortars, so we were running into dust. It was soft sand, luckily. So, um, and there was a little bit of a hill. So uh, Joseph and I connected, and I, I just took my backpack and just dumped it, um, you know, under a bush because I just realized this is going to get me killed. And I knew Joseph had had the radio. So then we got and we kind of cut off at an angle to the contact and went over a, over a hill and got out of the line of fire. So you know we were kind of covered by a little hill. Um, and then we started, you know, we started. Uh, we realized now we're in escape invasion mode, so we kind of ran with heavy tracks for for uh, a couple of minutes and then i said to joseph let's set up the booby trap so uh, so he we we went through and then dog legged back and uh, and i set up this booby trap as i as i practiced uh, and uh, and then we we went on joseph covered me i set it up and we went on and uh and we went on for about another 20 minutes and then uh i said to joseph let's uh, let's make um let's make comms with the base and tell them, tell them what's going on so he had the radio set up and started um, setting the radio up and as he was setting the radio up we heard the we heard the booby trap go off so they were already on our track but they'd, they'd set the booby trap off so that that slowed them down so joseph was trying to get scared with um with our headquarters but it wasn't the scared time so nobody nobody's actually there so we started frequency hopping and by chance we got we heard some some guy speaking in Afrikaans, and uh, so, so I just got on with him, and I said, um, I said basically, you know, we've we've been in this uh, major contact, 
just over like open open us if we've been in contact you please get a hold of uh you know our unit headquarters i gave them the call signs and everything and i said uh you know just tell them we need to make sked within an hour and um and uh and and, and he set it up for us so we were at uh at this like water hole it was um, I still remember this like water hole, so we managed to get some water because you know just from that little bit of time we were like exhausted and now we were in escape and invasion uh, kit so we had web webbing and we carried everything for us for this um, very situation so I had uh, two liters of water on my on my webbing but I didn't want to touch it you know because you I didn't know how long we were going to be be going so I had two liters of water and some emergency food and uh, luckily we were at this like water hole and it was so remote it was, there was actually leopard tracks at the water hole fresh leopard tracks so so we kind of knew that this was really really remote area nobody was nobody was around there were no locals so we we make as much as we could and then started uh, anti-tracking from there so we just all our skills unfortunately i left my anti-track boots were left with my backpack so i was anti-tracking with just flat sole boots so joseph and i started anti-tracking uh and evading just following all the techniques any anybody in on this call who was in 101 or Kufu would, would know the techniques that Swapo would do to avoid uh, uh being being tracked that's what we were applying you know we were bomb shelling going off different angles finding rocks to walk on just doing whatever we could to not leave leave uh, leave tra track so we we entered track for an hour and then made comms with um with our base I got all of dev scales and he said they would send up a uh, a Telstar that night. A Telstar has sent up an airplane, so they sent up an Impala as high as they can, and we'd be able to make open comms with a with a with a smaller radio and uh, and plan plan the evasion. So we said we'd make uh, we'd make I don't know what time we agreed nine o'clock. Uh, we'd make scared contact um, on the on the uh, on the high frequency radio. Um, so. They knew the situation. Unfortunately, they they recorded the whole the whole conversation. But uh, I got in contact with Dave afterwards. But they'd lost the uh, lost the tape. It would have been really good to to hear that, hear the whole conversation. Um, so we organised to um, to make uh, uh, contact with the uh, with Dave Scales at uh, at nine nine o'clock that night, and then we just carried on with uh, anti tracking. So then we knew we had to get out, and we started anti tracking towards getting on our evasion plan. Um, and then uh, at nine o'clock that night, we made contact with the with the Impala, um, and uh, and spoke to Dave, and then confirmed that we were going to uh, do escape and evasion down to the grid reference that we'd planned for that area. And uh, and they said they were going to try and get a um, a helicopter extraction the next night um, uh, for us if we got to that uh, to that uh, grid reference. So. That is the scenario. We had a day ahead of us um, of uh, of being chased. Essentially, was uh, was was what we were facing. We were pretty tired, and we we didn't want to um, even in the night because we knew that our anti tracking wouldn't be that good. So we actually stopped and we uh, we slept, um, and uh, and then woke up really early. So we just slept as we were. We actually made a little fire. We dug a hole and made a little fire. We kind of like lay head to feet around the fire just to get, it was quite cold. It was like, you know, it was May. Um, and, and we had no, I mean, we just had, we just had the kit. We had no, no jackets, nothing. So it was, it was quite chilly. We made a little fire and then kind of lay around the fire and just try and get some sleep. So we actually got sleep. We were pretty, pretty tired and, and exhausted. You can imagine this whole situation. There's a lot of adrenaline, uh, you know, it's kind of shock. So we were pretty exhausted. So we slept and then we woke up, I think about 4 a.m., uh, like first light covered up everything um, you know try to try to you know not leave any traces and then just started like dog legging and and, and anti-tracking and um, we were sometimes even walking out of sight from each other but we knew you know we kind of agreed we'd meet up at a place and we'd be out of sight so we'd be anti-tracking joseph would be maybe four or five hundred meters away from me also heading in the same direction just anti-tracking as much as we could and then we could just hear vehicles. There was so much activity. We could just hear vehicles. You know, it's like vehicles and trucks. And uh, so clearly they were on on our trying to find us. And then we had to cross some some roads as well, which are challenging. Um, you know, you have to cross a road, not leave tracks. You know, so it's the old thing of like, get to the road. You walk backwards. You have your hat, or you have a. I think I was using my map. And then you and you just you know make wind to like break your track up. So like stealthily get across. So we did all these things and. Uh, 
and and just and to track. But as I said, there were just vehicles everywhere, and they were clearly they knew about us, and they were and they were they probably knew there was like a white operator, and they were like really happy to catch catch this person. But just going back now, as I, as these memories come up, I remember as as I was running with a with a backpack, uh, I was like, I was I, I was making making deals with God about if I get out of this, I would, I would never drink again. And like that was going through my mind, you know, while, while you're going through the stuff, you just have, you have this, you know, you just realize what's going on, but it wasn't actually, um, I don't know. The only fear I had was like, I don't want to get caught here. You know, I just don't, that, that was it. I didn't want to, you know, vein on class situation. So for me, I'd rather die or get out. I didn't want to get caught. So that, that was, that was my fear. I just didn't want to get caught. So I got away from that. But then the next day it was like hard because, um, mentally you you know you you know you're being chased and uh and you have these people on your trail and you and you're just trying your best to to get away it is so you i had a lot of sympathy now for you know what any swap or infiltrators must have felt you know being being chased as well the, the shoes on the other foot for sure um but i think our anti-tracking must have been pretty good because they they didn't get us um and mike mashai with the other operator he what he did was um in the contact he dog legged the other way but he stayed with a group of the unitas and and he stayed with them and he went back to the unita base but he very bravely that night came back to see uh, if we were there uh he came back to the com uh, contact site with the unitas to see if we were there uh and to try and find us i do remember as we were running away <clears throat> a couple of unitas tried to make a skirmish line and they were like getting ready to to um i don't know if they wanted they weren't firing but they were getting ready to to uh uh looked like they were going to start firing and the one was calling me over but he had a pair of like really light light pants and uh, and he was calling me over to come and i looked at him and I, i'm not going near you with those pants and as i moved on the dust started hitting around them and he got shot through the stomach so uh, so they were on him and got away so there's like little fleeting fleeting moments in that in that in that run that uh, that, that jumped to mind so we uh we evaded uh, anti-tracked and got to the area where uh we agreed was the pickup i was hoping it's the area because now you know i had i had my map with me and had obviously compass and we kind of knew where we were but you know angola being angola actually this is northern angola so there were more there were more landmarks there were kind of rocky mountains and uh and uh, so there were there were landmarks so i was kind of sure we were pretty sure we were in the area um that we were supposed to get picked up in and then we came to the area and actually it is a massive shauna shauna being you know open piece of flat land which floods uh, in the summer, it was near a massive Shauna, and uh, there was this uh, rocky outcrop next to the Shauna. So I said to Joseph, "Okay, let's let's uh, to to uh, to Mike, let's let's hold up here and um, and then uh, and then wait for the pickup." And um, so we basically got ready for the last stand. We set ourselves up, got our magazines out, and just got ready because if if they found us there, it would have been basically a shootout, and that would have been the end of it. You know, we would have wouldn't have been able to do anything more. So we kind of got ourselves defended so we we could defend ourselves as much as we could if we got if they finally caught up with us um luckily it was kind of already about 5 p.m so we didn't have to wait too long for it to start getting dark <clears throat> and um and then and then and then it was dark and we were waiting for the helicopter to come so we had we had the small uh high frequency radio at the time and uh we got it set up by now batteries were running out um and uh and and we waited, and then we um, we heard we heard the helicopter. So we heard we heard um, we heard the sound of the helicopter. So got the radio up, and uh, and started. And we made comms with the helicopters, though, but the comms were really bad. Um, and uh, I, I can't remember which um, which uh, unit it was, but it was the long range uh, Puma squadron. Um, they basically the the Puma was just one big um, um, tank of tank of fuel uh because it's long range and uh and night night flying capabilities so they were coming in low at um huge risk you know being as i said um uh, angola's uh, air defense was uh was superb at that time so these guys two two helicopters came in two pumas unarmed um uh, came in to to pick us up so we we heard we heard the the one puma coming made comms i made comms the pilot and us I, I said um you know head north head north and he thought I was saying, you are north, you are north. So he <laughs> I'm not joking. He turned around and started going south. And I was like, and then he was out of comms again. So I was like, and, and then he got back into comms and we were, 
we were, I didn't want to shoot flares or anything, you know, because we were compromised ourselves. So he said to me, he said, buddy, I've got five more minutes and I've got to get out of here. So we thought to hell with it. We started shooting flares and uh, compromised ourselves completely. And then the, um, the, um, I think the uh, flight sergeant, because they were facing the wrong way, saw, saw the flares and said, are oh, you on the shore now? So he said, yes. Yeah. So he said, okay, I'm landing. So he, um, he tracked the, the helicopter down, but we could, we could see he was like, you know, like three, 400 meters away. He put it down, and we just uh, we just ran ran to the helicopter and uh, and and got in. I remember they had uh, they made a, a whole meal of um, tomato and onion sandwiches, which was amazing because we hadn't eaten for day and a half. So um, we took off, started scoffing the sandwiches, but flying back, I mean, there was just anti aircraft fire everywhere. So you know, it was uh, it still wasn't wasn't over. So um, they they got us out. And got us back to uh, to I think we flew out to Rukon no Andongwa. Got us back to Andongwa, and the second helicopter picked up Mike at um, at the Unita base. So so he was picked up at the same time. But he was you know he was with Unita, so he was he was okay and had uh, clear calm. So he'd managed to 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 get a better evasion plan and and um, and uh, not Mike Joseph. Um, and uh, no, that was Mike. Yeah, Mike got a uh, he, he was with Unita, and, and Joseph and I got the extraction. So we all met up that night back at um, Andongwa. And uh, they had a big bright place for us, and uh, and and that that was the end of it. So we 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 survived the whole thing. So that is that is um, that is a pretty intense, you know, second second operation. Uh, but uh, that was it. Yeah, I haven't um, I haven't spoken about this for for a long time. No, yeah. it's great. It's great that you're telling us the story. And and this would have been sort of mid eighty eight. Yeah, this is um this is May May eighty eight. Yeah, it was tenth of May um that we actually started the operation. Yeah, I think the contact over there uh, on the twentieth of May we actually had this uh, this what happened. Actually, we did a whole debrief. I've got the whole debrief notes and everything still from the from the whole thing. Okay, my last camp. But some interesting my... interesting points, you know, like uh, yeah, go. Sorry, my last camp was uh. Hooper and Packer, or Packer and Hooper. So it was from February to to May '88. Um, so I would have been yeah. there. I mean, obviously in a different area, but uh, we were trying yeah. to sort yeah. out Peter Kunewal. But uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's just uh, it was interesting times, and I remember the pilots' names. I don't know what their surnames. I'd like to get hold of them. One pilot's name was Harry, and the other one was uh, Mike. We actually met them in a bar by chance in Randburg. Um, a year later, uh, and had a massive drinking session with them. But um, uh, it'd be cool to get hold I'll, of them. I don't know. I'll I don't do know my, what their names are. I'll do my best. Um, I've met up with quite a few of the chopper pilots since I've been involved with this legacy. You know, I yeah, don't know if you saw this. Out, yeah. I don't know if you saw the story with HP Ferreira. He was with us on smoke and he got shot with a fourteen point five one. And all he's ever yeah. wanted to do. Was find the pilot that took him out because Puma came in under twenty three mil yeah. fire and and took him out and uh, we we managed to find him and HP has been in contact with him so so I'm wow. sure we'll we'll make a plan Mike and Harry yeah I'm sure it was Mike and Harry but I mean this is unusual so I'm sh there must be some Puma pilots who have in their logbook this operation so yeah it'd be really interesting to to get hold of that yeah so. Uh, a couple of things like my dad. So this is um, going back to I think I told you about my dad. He actually did escape invasion in World War Two, where he got shot down in uh, Yugoslavia. And, and um, I don't know if I told you the story, but uh, he actually saw he just blown up a train and he was flying treetop level and and a squad of Nazis was standing there and a guy shot him down with a machine gun and uh, he bailed out. And as he's coming down in his parachute. The, you could see the trucks coming to, you know, the Nazi trucks were coming to get him. So he landed and, and he did his own escape invasion as well. So he managed to evade um, evade uh, the Germans and connect up with the uh, with the partisans. Uh, so kind of interesting talk to him afterwards, you know, like experiences and stuff. So yeah, yeah, I think like father um, like son kind of kind of yeah. situation. I don't know how many how many people have that with you know father and son having done done it. Sure. Yeah, experience that. I think what. I think what we must do is when we finished your your military story, I'd like to do a, a 
interview where we talk about your father and because you i think you've got a fair amount of knowledge yeah. of what he did and, and it'd be nice to put it yeah, out there yeah. Uh, yeah just yeah, for the listeners yeah yeah but just for the listeners andre's father was involved in world war ii and korea as a pilot and was instrumental in bringing the impala to south africa but uh, i think we'll do a separate story on that uh yeah yeah no that's uh, it'll be a good one yeah. yeah as you know like well you know there's the whole connections that you know there's a part impala was a telstar that we did the connection my brother the flink impala's got killed in impala so yeah there's all that like connections that which yeah. is slightly interesting yeah and uh but just just a comment on like you know like how we operated and you know folks if they can should watch this movie um uh, lone survivor uh which is a similar situation but with the american seals but the mentality and how they operate versus us you know we were we were like i said trying not to be involved in contact so you know I actually got criticized afterwards for not standing my ground and 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 <laughs> and engaging yeah, with the enemy. And like you can read, like how did you, you know? You, but, but people are like that, you know. So people are like, oh, you know, why didn't you stand and fight? And like, oh, like whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were we were trained to like get away, you yeah. know. So that's how it was, and that is in our mindset, and it saved yeah. us, right? Yeah, and it was more but, important uh, that you yeah. got out alive than uh, than took out a few of them and got killed, you know. Exactly. I mean, then we got trained by the best, Chris Schulenberg. That is, I mean, that's that's was was our that is our. But if you watch the Lone Survivor, the seals are very much uh, very offensive orientated. You know, so they're very very much about com combat and these big guys with a lot of equipment going into that same situation. The minute they get compromised, they they you know first of all they they drills when they get compromised are wrong. They carry on and do and they carry on in this offensive mindset of like a team of five being able to fight your way out. You can't do it. You know, so they they ended up. You know, in a in a really bad situation. I mean, in the end, I think only one only one of them survived. Uh, but um, when I'm watching the movie, I could just see, oh, that's mistake number one, mistake number two, and it's obviously again end up in a bad story. But they just didn't have the same level of training. Yeah. And later on, when I connected with some SAS folks, they also they couldn't believe how we operated in the small teams. And again, I don't I don't think even today. I mean, today it's like really different now with uh, all the thermal imagery and stuff. I think reconnaissance now is not possible the way it was then uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't think anybody works in small teams uh, the way we did okay and then after that after that episode was that sort of the last oh uh, no there's uh, more to come, still to come. Uh, okay <laughs> there's more to come so 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 yeah i mean uh I had a debrief i was actually fine like i was like you know uh, i was pretty pretty jazzed i remember Chris asking me, how do you feel about this? Uh, how do you feel about going on operations again? I was fine. Like I said, I'm fine. You know, um, uh, and then um, we actually did deploy again myself and uh, and Mike uh, because now the, the Cuban incursion was like serious. 3-2 was involved in con. And I, I'm, folks should read read uh, the history there because I'm just taking out of my head. I might have things out of, out of context, but 3-2 was actually in combat with... Um, with the Cubans around the Tachipa area, and things were really hot, hot, hotting up. But like, um, um, I think uh, Kalawek had been bombed, um, so things were super hot, hot uh, in in that area at that time. So they wanted us to go and see how they were crossing the um, the Humbi River, because the Humbi River is like one of tributary going into um, into the Kuneni. And there was a bridge like over the Humbi River, which uh, they were interested in us finding out about. So, so myself and Mike infiltrated again. Uh, I think we actually got we got dropped off by two hundred one battalion, and then we started walking up. But like by now, I knew the area, so we started walking up west of the Kuneni, got up east of Zangongo, got up to the bridge, <laughs> and uh, we we got up to the river, and and we um, we hold up the day in the river, and then followed the river around. At mid midnight or about two in the morning, and I was Mike, Mike and I were, were patrolling, and I came along and like bumped into this cow, and I was like, "This is not right. There's a cow and it's tied up, um, you know." And it kind of knew, and then and then looked, and we were literally in 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 the base. So we were like literally in a in a in a in a in an enemy base uh, with the tents and everything. The guy snoring, or like the cow was there, and, and about you know twenty meters away were tents, and and we were like, "Oh shit!" So here we are. So um so we kind of looked around, everybody was sleeping. The first thought of mind is like, you know, should I chuck a grenade? Should I shoot? Yeah, you know, that's the first thing you think, but obviously it's not what you're gonna do, right? So so then we 
we we moved out and crossed the crossed the road and and put our put our kit kit down and everything and then and then we came back and infiltrated back, got back to where we were and then started uh, um, uh, snooping around and then came around to the other side of the camp where the bridge was, and there there were guards standing, you know, obviously standing around a fire, talking to each other, and there was the old bridge was was there like you know the Portuguese bridge, but then on the other side was one of these these um, collapsible um, uh, bridges, you know, Soviet. Um, uh, um, collapsible bridges that that would over the uh, over the river. So, so I thought I better check this out. Mike, Mike, basically took cover and covered the guards, and I went round and got onto the bridge. And I had a I had a a, um, a um, piece of paracord, and I kind of measured the bridge uh, and made knots, measured, made knots, measured, and climbed over the bridge and all over. All this time, the guards were like literally twenty meters away, talking to each other. Mike covering me. So I got all the measurements of the bridge, uh, looked around, got, uh, made notes about the camp, got back to Mike, and we just scoped everything out, and uh, and then moved out. And again, walking past trucks and stuff, and you know, you think, you know, oh, should I do some kind of boot wrap thing here or not? Um, uh, and and didn't and picked up some Cuban cigarettes. There was like uh, packets of cigarettes, so it was Cubans there. Um, uh, with vehicles and everything, no tanks, but it was just uh, obviously a bridge building unit that were getting ready to, you know, um, assist crossing the Humbi River. Um, and uh, we got back to our kit and just started planning what we could do. And I remember the moon came up and it was this massive, massive full moon. And I was like, oh my god, no, you know, like it's like daylight almost. But we'd we'd done the recce and and we'd got all the all the all the um, the details that we needed. And uh, and then we decided, okay, let's let's get out. And um, um, we um, we started exfiltrating and uh, and moved down south and and made made scared and and just carried on moving. And then by then, two hundred one battalion was actually in the area, so we made uh, we made plans to connect with uh, with two hundred one for for a pickup. And again, we we moved through the, through the day. And then, to your question, there were there were Menno Ace and 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 a couple of other small teams were also in the area, and they and they were coming as well for 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 pickup. So everybody was moving down, and we we're moving down in the day. But this is Angola, um, you know, obviously wearing uh, enemy uniform, black face, and the whole thing. And then and then we just started hearing there was just running contacts going on. There was like so there was activity, there was stuff going on around us. So I think um, Kufut and 101 were involved in uh, in contacts on the other side of the river, but also on our side. And uh, Meno were they were they were north of us, and they thought that myself and Mike were in, in the contact. So there was this like miscommunication going on. We got to we got to the spot uh, where um, where we we're going to get picked up, and uh, it's actually in Ian Ace's book, but he's got the whole story wrong about how we got picked up. But anyhow, so. Uh, Bushman came, met up, met, met us, uh, picked us up, picked up Meno and 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 his partner, and uh, and then we we uh, exfiltrated to um, to back to Ondangwa, and then met up with everybody, and they were planning they were planning I think to attack the base, so we were, we were like getting set up to you know, attack the bridge. You no, know, we're getting so we were you know, doing plans, and uh, some of those well, one recce operators up there, and I think they were planning uh, to go in to do it, but they they never did. I don't know why. They called it off, but um, you know we were going to be going in the next couple of days. But then they called the whole thing off, and um, and then and then kind of everything ended. We all got withdrawn, and I think you know they they came to these uh, um, uh, uh, peace agreements, and and the whole the whole kind of conflict stopped. And that was that is sort of the, I think that was the last. I mean, we we were I think the last. Uh, speaking to Mike, uh, rest in peace. Mike Mike has passed away, as is Joseph. Um, and Mike was actually a. Uh, a uh, senior sergeant major in the military up until he retired, um, uh, very well respected, Mike Mashai. Um, speak to him afterwards. You know, I WhatsApped him and texted him, and he said we were the last small teams operations in in the in the in the Angolan War. So uh, the Humbi Humbi Bridge Recce called it. So it is it is pretty cool. We we were the last uh, last proper proper operation, and um, and um, and it was an amazing experience. But that that was the end of it, and. Um, and uh, after that, we flew back to South Africa and you know, got back to, uh, you know, just training, in-base training, and and um, and 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 regular regular kind of uh, base operations. So that was the end of our, our Angolan um, uh, foray at that time.
Um, so we are then then being back in Palabora with small teams. I, you know, I was I was really jazzed about the small team stuff, and I was struggling to be in the base um, and being under base routine. Uh, I really struggled, so I was asking to go and live in the bush. Uh, um, you know, in, in, in the Palaboria area, like my plan was like live in the bush and then we have five Sai or the, the, the local national service units come and try and find us. And, you know, we just keep, keep, keep training and keep live operations and try and be as um, operational as possible. But uh, our leaders were not having that. They wanted us in the base and, you know, packing equipment and doing standard PT in the mornings and everything. And I was like, not enjoying any of this at all. It's very, very micromanagey and, you know, it's just not my style at all. So I decided I'm going to resign. Uh, and I said, I'm I'm going to resign. And uh, then um, Nick Detroit of the offensive teams in um, Fire 3 recce heard that I was going to leave. So he said, no, well, don't leave. Come come to come to Fire 3. Uh, so I left small teams and, uh, and went to Fire 3, um, which was uh, an offensive team's uh, uh, unit, so you know more on raids and uh, and offensive operations. So no more small teams. Um, so I went there, and then got into the routine with them. And you know it was like more practicing house clearing and uh, you know just that kind of stuff to get my mind into into that into that kind of work. Um, and then at that time, you know obviously we could do training and everything. And I got opportunity to go and do free fall uh, down in in Bloemfontein. So I went down to Bloemfontein, did free fall uh, course. Which was which was amazing. Um, I did have one situation where um, I was I was coming into land in Bloemfontein. I was w with a square square shoot full kit and uh, coming into land and Bloemfontein being Bloemfontein, there was a there was a dust devil that was coming at me and uh, I got caught up in a dust devil at about you know, 30, 30 feet forty feet above the ground. My shoot collapsed. So I fell. I fell basically real free fall uh no shoot and uh ambulance everybody came rushing up to see if i was okay but i was okay i just had my rifle strapped under my under my shoulder and i just cut myself really badly and bruised my hip really badly and i remember going up to Joburg that weekend my girlfriend at the time was now my wife um just showing her like she was just what kind of people are you who are bruised and battered and bleeding and and permanent you know, black is beautiful enough. You know, you know, you know, skin. It was it was crazy time, but yeah, that and that is really fun, fun course. I mean, then you in Bloemfontein and you know, uh, drinking at night and weekends and going to Joburg and it was it was really fun. Um, so that 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 was really a re really cool uh, cool opportunity. And then I also got opportunity to go and become an instructor on the selection course, and just saw the selection course from an instructor's perspective, and that that is also an eye opener to see how tough the course was. I mean, it's tough enough being an instructor on that, walking with these guys, evaluating them, and uh, uh, so um, got the perspective of you know how hard the selection was just from as an instructor's perspective, uh, which is which is really interesting. Um, then um, then things started. Kicking off in in Namibia again. Um, I don't know if you remember in like April '89, uh, Swapo did that massive incursion. Uh, I think Peter Stiff wrote a book about it called The Nine Days of War. They did a massive incursion and um, actually caught Kufut and some folks by surprise. Um, and there was a big redeployment. Uh, I was at infantry school at the time doing a mortar course, and I wanted to go back up. And I think um, uh, I was told I don't have to go. But um, one of our um, um, one of my my course that went through my my selection course that went through who who qualified with us um, uh, Herman Carstens he was killed in a combat in a contact then he was the last person in the in the, uh, okay. in, the in the whole co uh, um, conflict to be killed um, so that that is that is the last the last uh, um, uh, contact that that happened or last person that got killed but he was in my my selection uh, group. Um, uh, then we we were just doing track more and more training, and then Untag Untag came up, um, and uh, we were suddenly deployed back into uh, Namibia to support the uh, the election process, which was uh, also very interesting because this is actually my last recce. Um, we, um, you know, all the Swapa forces came down, and the Fapla forces came down, and they came right down to the border, and there was this kind of standoff, obviously tension between us and them because we'd you know been fighting all these years i remember we rode up in caspers to the to the border and there was this company size um 
uh, swap a base across across the road, across the border, and everybody was kind of standoff. You know, like they were like ready for us attacking them, and we were nervous they were going to shoot at us. And uh, we looked at them and came back, and then the major in charge of us at the time said, "No, we we should plan to attack this base," which is complete madness. But they said, "Plan to attack this base," and he said, "Like I." I should go up and do a recce and and get all the information, you know, so we can uh, we can we can attack the base if we if we wanted to. So that that was like my last recce myself and one of the um, uh, ex small team operators who was also in uh, in five three at the time planned the recce and we walked up. Um, uh, we walked up like northeast of the base and came back as if we were UNITA and got got to the base where they were at night that night and we kind of got got to the base and skirted out and mapped out where we would attack from you know getting crawl walls and where they were where the trenches were and again right being right in the in the in the in the base and seeing where they're sleeping and everything so we got got that all laid out walked back again or walked straight back to the Casper it was like na navigation was amazing it was just like when we were walking 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 suddenly the Caspers were there and then got back and then gave the the details to the to the major but clearly more more sensible minds uh, prevailed and uh, and they decided not to attack the base because it had been complete against all the agreements and protocols at the time so we didn't do that base attack but we we were close to it and people were kind of annoyed that it was going to happen um and and not not really supporting it so um then i just remember you know the times when you know because during that time there were a lot of um you know uh, australians british uh military was there all helping the uh the um the transition process and the british obviously most of them were sas and we would be drinking with them pretending they were pretending they were storemen and we were pretending we were electricians and you know so everybody's like not saying who they are but everybody's like super good shape and really fit and you can see i actually got into one of the um i got into their signal tent and saw their equipment and uh and uh saw how primitive their equipment was compared to oh, their radios you know like obviously they were communicating with the uk but the size of the equipment and they didn't have frequency hopping and you know so their their actual level of equipment was not as good as ours we were i mean south african equipment as you all know was superior really superior in those times we just bought the best we could get and bought the best we could, could especially from the communication perspective that is interesting to see that stuff and see their kit you know see um i mean they're actually getting drunk the one night he admitted he was in the sas and we spoke about stuff and and uh it was really interesting uh interesting time to see you know how how they did things and and and, and operated so that is that is kind of interesting time then and then also we would be going to bars in of you know so this is a completely new thing so we would never drink in in cookers that is like going to like you know you remember all the nightclubs in on Dangwa and, and and Oshikati you know you always had the the you know they had these outrageous names so we went to those nightclubs and there would be like you know all the British paratroopers and everybody trying to mix with the local girls and we would be in there and there's all this tension there's always like fights and just interesting time um so that, that that was really interesting but that that really was winding down the end of the end of everything we did have, yeah, I'm not going to talk about, there was a really bad situation, incident, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, then um, the end of that, my my kind of last deployment, I think they thought I was kind of like a bit on edge. So five, five Reiki was looking after four doppies at the time. So they said for me to cool down, they sent me to four doppies uh, for Christmas and uh, New Year to be the base commander. So I, I flew, up to, well, I flew from, uh, I think, uh, uh, sector one zero to to four topies and and spent a, just over a month there as the base commander for topies which is probably the, the most fun month i've ever had in my life it was just an amazing time you know being 23 24 years old you're in charge of a base in the middle of you know the caprivi you know uh with all the wildlife and most beautiful environment uh, it's just just an amazing time and you know like I, what i do every day was i just go down to the uh, shooting range and just just practice snap shooting and shoot and then I'd go and gave and drives or oh, I I got then I found out that um I could get uh, alouette over and we could do a game count so we got an alouette spent the day flying over the area like counting elephants and uh flying up the Quanda River I remember flying up the Quanda River with headphones on hearing dire straits with, you know just this sublime you know low level of the river watching Lechwe running running and seeing the hippos and, and listening to dire straits while we were doing it it's just just amazing um and uh and then out of the blue two two girls show up 
they they were they were um clothing reps for you know for the locals they showed up and they spent a couple of days with us and um um yeah it was just such fun and then we we went to Mapacha and we saw Miss South Africa was going to come up to do some tour and somehow I found out I could book bungalows at the same time so we booked and like, there we show up the same weekend that Miss South Africa shows up and we we bumped into her and uh and kind of hung out with her and partied with her a bit and then I got into a lot of trouble because um they invited us to a party that was for them and we weren't invited and at the time like nobody really knew what unit we were in because we weren't saying what we were but we were you know and so we were invited to the party and I showed up at the party and the major took offense to me being there because we wasn't invited so I got in a fight with the major I crashed the Hilux Toyota Hilux and so when they figured out who we were we got signals from the sector commander that I'd be out of the sector by by noon the next day we created so much trouble so I kind of licked my wounds out, 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 and went back to Fort Dorpies and um, and uh, had to deal with the, you know what it was like when you when you crash a vehicle as a Toyota King Cab, I dented it and uh, had to deal with all that. So, um, and then we had a staff course. Staff course came up to visit, and um, and they and they had a party at at Fort Dorpies, and I was super introverted at the time, so I met them and everything, and but I wasn't interested in having a party with them, so I went out and I was wandering around at night. And they, they got really drunk. These all lieutenant colonels and colonels, and uh, they got drunk and they got into my vehicle park and started started the Unimog. So I came over there, uh, AK in hand, and uh, walked into the into the room and like started yelling at these colonels. And they were all lying in their beds like like little kids, you know. I was like, you know, who's who's, who's been driving my vehicles and everything? This was a crazy person. So that was just an amazing time, you know. Which is uh, it was great. And then after that, uh, flew back to South Africa, and that is really the end of end of my end of my military career what was happening then was they wanted me to stay on but they wanted me to go into uh into uh intelligence services so i was going to end end my contract going to intelligence service what was happening then is that a lot of uh ex operators were being given opportunities to become civilians and startup companies and then start a a whole other intelligence network um and this is the time of you know the whole decision and there were there were weird things going on at that time which i don't really want to go into but you know there was all the um the third force um rumors and, and that actually was happening so there was stuff and we were folks were getting involved in that and i didn't feel comfortable at all with any of it and um so they made me a a offer to uh, go into intelligence i was going to get a farm in the in the western transvaal and start a business and you know it's going to be a cover for studio operations into zimbabwe and uh i just i just didn't feel comfortable with any of it and uh so i, I declined the offer and left and by then i was kind of i think i left on bad terms you know with everybody like because I, I had an attitude i wasn't getting on with in fact chris Dudler wrote a book and he didn't write anything about our experiences that i told about now it's out of the book he, he didn't include any of it um he didn't like us at all um and uh and the fact that i'd gone against this offer and just so I, I i left under a cloud so i wasn't really um you know i don't think i i um you know the, the powers that be at the time um yeah didn't 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 seem any good light but i, I still have i you know i'm still in contact with the a lot of the the operators that uh that i worked with like really senior well-known operators uh, uh people that are respected so you know on, on that person a personal level I was, I was fine but um i think with the leadership at the time i wasn't really really well well regarded and that that is the end of um, that is the end of it. I'm sure I've missed a lot of details and everything, but that is that is the sum total of my of my unoperational career with uh, with uh, Fabric. So in 1990, I I left the military, South African military, and uh, then started new adventures. And that is uh, that is that. No, great, Andre. That's been very interesting. Um, I think um, for the legacy viewers out there, thanks for watching. Um, thanks, Andre. And we will have two follow-ups, one to discuss your time in the Israeli army. Um, yeah. I don't think you were there that long. Uh, or... No, I was um, I was in Israel for a total of five years, but actually in the army, only about six months. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then yeah. I think we'll end off the fifth episode uh, discussing your father, Tank Oerendahl. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the conversation, he was a fighter pilot in... World War II, Korea, 
and yeah. uh, quite a high ranking officer in the SA Air Force, uh, introduced the Impala to the, the South African Air Force. Um, so I think that would be quite an interesting um, story. Yeah. Okay. But thank you. Yeah.